Okay. Very exciting. Um, all right, so I'm uh, Dan Katz from University of Illinois. Um, I should, I guess, start by saying that I feel a little bit like an imposter here uh, because I'm not actually developing Jupyter or developing Jupyter Hub, um, but what we're doing is developing a system that works for Python. And I think some of the things that it does within, um, that it lets users do in terms of uh, launching jobs on supercomputers and interacting with those jobs and moving data around um, is fairly uh, overlapping some of the things that I have heard about. So, um, so perhaps in some ways this is something that may be actually interesting to some people outside of this workshop just as a, a tool to use, but it also might be interesting as a, as a different model of how some of these things are done. Um, and I should also say that uh, the people that are listed on the, on the slide here as authors kind of range from uh, the people at the front who are the technical people who spend almost all of their time actually doing this work uh, to those of us that are on the back, and I probably would be at the back, uh, who are the kind of the co-PIs who don't actually do a lot of the hands-on piece, but, um, but do the architecture and work with user groups and try to make sure everything looks good. Okay, so, uh, so the reason that we're, we're doing this is that uh, software is increasingly assembled rather than written. Uh, there are uh, pieces that already exist and we want to integrate and wrap those together. And um, often that means that we need to use parallel and distributed computing, HPC, uh, because of more data, because that's the resources that actually have the ability to do things because we want to use accelerators. So Parcel um, has been written for, um, from the point of view of trying to express parallelism in such a way that programs can say what pieces could be run in parallel. Uh, and then at execution time, we actually figure out how to best run those on the resources that are available. Uh, the, uh, I think uh, the talk that you gave before, you had a little box about Cori and a bunch of things there. Uh, one of the pieces, one of the little boxes was Swift. Um, and so if people are familiar with Swift at all, I would say that Parcel is a re-implementation of Swift from scratch in Python um, because we realized that there were some problems with Swift and we wanted to uh, to kind of start again in a common language and get rid of a bunch of old code and try to make things a bit cleaner. So, um, so Parcel then has this idea that you, um, you define uh, functions that either could be Python functions or bash functions. Uh, you grab them and build a decorator. Um, and that then means that they um, still do whatever they were going to do, but they return a future instead of returning a result. And the fact that they return a future then means that you can go on without that um, actually having been satisfied. Uh, you can do these in parallel then if the data dependencies are uh, allow that. Um, and the other thing that's nice is in general, we try not to say anything about resources at this level. So, um, so these functions could run on within the notebook itself. They could run on remote resources. We don't say that at this point. We have a different way of saying that later on. Oh, and, uh, and then this is all right, standard Python, pip, install, everything normal. Uh, open source, GitHub, uh, Apache 2, uh, contributors welcome, all that good stuff. Ah, okay, and, uh, and also you can try this um, via binder if you want to, and so it's available and ready to go. Um, parcelproject.org, and it's, there's a try, parcel, try parcel down at the bottom. Um, I think most of the stuff I'm gonna show is in tutorials that are on there. There's one thing I'll show about multi-site execution that's not, um, but we can make that available if anybody's interested in it. So just like one example of how you do this might be that you have some, um, some, some shell script, in this case, doc. It could be an MPI application that, that does some kind of docking. Uh, wrap this in a little, Little decorator, uh, and you call it inside of a loop. And when you call it, you have it uh, running a bunch of things and filling up the structure. And once the structure is filled, then you actually do something with the structure. And so that basically says that all of these things can run in parallel, and this piece is going to have to wait until all of these things finish. But you don't have to actually say that within your code. Um, what happens internally uh, is that, oh, and I guess I should have said, which is probably obvious, that all the stuff, because it's Python runs inside of a notebook, which I guess is the connection here. Um, so one of the examples here, we have, right, we have our code, we have some calls. Um, those calls, as we see functions that are decorated, those decorators basically tell us that here's a task that we should put into a DAG, a directed acyclic graph, and so we're building a DAG as we go along. Uh, we keep building the DAG as things happen, as 
we have the DAG built, we can start to run some of it. We can run it on, on cloud resources or HPC resources. As those things finish, they then let other parts of the DAG run. And other parts of the DAG also may run because we have gone through more of the code and we've pulled out more, more tasks. So that's kind of basically the, the model of how this works. Um, this is all execution provider independent. So we can, we can run on grids, cloud, supercomputers. Um, we uh, can use containers in a couple of different ways. Um, and, uh, and, yeah, and then there's a bunch of different kinds of resources that we have the ability to work on. I'm going to talk a little bit about how you actually configure those and, and what that means at the very end without very much detail, but with a little bit of detail because it does, again, match some of the things other people have been talking about. Um, so uh, just one, one way of looking at this is that, uh, is that we, have, uh, we have different executors. So this is a pilot jobs on a cluster. Midway is a cluster to Chicago. We also have thread loop a lot. Um, we do this through a config object. This is kind of just a way of saying how this config object is defined and, and actually set up. Um, and there's a bunch of different options again about the channels between the place that you're running the notebook and the place that you want to run the tasks. Uh, what the provider is meaning is the queuing system or how do you actually interact with that. Um, and then kind of things that are specific to the queuing system, um, and then extra things you might be adding as well. Um, and so, again, I, I don't want to actually get into a lot of the detail here. This is probably more detail than I should have gone into, but this is all, I think, fairly well documented, and there's a read the docs page that, that talks about this and kind of gives a, a little four-step way of trying to do this, uh, trying to set up a configuration for a system. We also have, um, in the documentation, example configurations for... Uh, something like eight or ten different systems that are fairly common, including Cori and some of the systems in Argon and, and a few other things. So, uh, okay, all right. And so when you do this, then um, the fact uh, if you have um, if you put in a, a parameter in your uh, decorator that says where you want to run, um, then these things actually can run on those resources that you specify. Um, so you can say that particular apps want to run on specific resources, or you can say, if you don't say that, it'll run on whatever resources. It seems to be the right thing that's available. Um, so this thing, as I was kind of saying, gives you interactive supercomputing in Jupyter Notebooks because inside the notebook, you're launching things that are going on to supercomputers. You're not doing this from the notebook level. You're not doing this from a Jupyter Lab level. You're doing this from the library, the parcel library is, is capturing this and making this happen. Um, so one of the challenges then is authentic uh, authentication and authorization. Um, we're using Globus Auth to do this right now. Uh, and this accesses Globus and other services. And um, I don't know, there's not a whole lot that I can say about this because this is not really my area of things. But um, if anybody's interested in the details, I can certainly put you in touch with the, the people that are doing this. But it's, I, I think the key part here is that this is basically just using Globus's methods and it, and it works. Uh, we also then have transparent uh, data management, wide area data management. So we have a, um, a class that's a, a file class. Uh, and so we can have a Globus slash something file. And when we run that on a remote system, um, we stage that file into the remote system, work on it, and can stage it back if that's the right thing, depending on where the output should be. And that all happens in the background. Uh, it uses Globus transfer. Uh, we can also use HTTP and FTP for data staging if we need to, uh, in addition to Globus. Um, there is, for the DOE people that are here, there's this activity going on called DCDE, which is a group that's trying to look at best practices and challenges to uh, federate distributed computing and data systems across different platforms in the DOE. Um, it's working towards a pilot. It's using OAuth and working with Globus, and there's a test deployment at Brookhaven um, that is there, and, and we're working as part of this. Um, so there's some initial work that's trying to link Oak Ridge and Brookhaven, and we've added support for an OAuth SSH channel that is being tested at uh, Oak Ridge now. Um, this is actually as of about a week ago. I was supposed to get an update yesterday, which I didn't get, so I don't know exactly how this testing is going, but I think it was going reasonably well a week <laughs> Um, so just then to give an, an example of what multi-site execution here potentially means. Um, so we can have a parcel configuration that says we're going to run on two sites. When you actually load that configuration, that creates SSH channels. 
Um, those SSH channels then are used to deploy an interchange process onto the login nodes and then submit pilot jobs onto those nodes that then connect to that interchange. Um, Parcel submits tasks to the interchange um, and Globus uses, uh, Parcel uses Globus then to stage data. So, uh, sorry, I should, uh, this wasn't exactly animated right, but basically, so Parcel opens the SSH channels, um, starts the interchange and then submits jobs to pilot jobs that are running on the interchange with Globus being used to move things around between them. So the Globus data transfer doesn't go back to Parcel, it just talks between the different channels. Um, there's a bunch of code that shows this and I didn't like the code, so I'm gonna show a demo instead of showing the code because it was too little. Um, the code itself is available, we just made this public this morning, so if anybody's interested, you can actually get to this. Uh, you, I don't know that you can run it necessarily, but you can certainly see it. Um, and let me show you the demo. Uh, sorry, I don't wanna show you the demo that way. Uh, I want to show you the demo. This way, okay. So, uh, right, so this is uh, Yadu uh, doing screen capturing and this was in Binder at the time, it's not there anymore. Um, sorry, I'm gonna try to go through what's there. So, uh, basically we're gonna use uh, Tatum Okay, this is very small, so I apologize, but I'll tell you what's happening. We're going to use theta and chlorine. Um, and so we're just going to make sure that we're actually um, able to connect via SSH to both of those uh, theta and chlorine. And we can. Just demonstrating. Um, sorry, we're not really very good at screen captures at this point. Uh, so we uh, have to load Anaconda on those systems, create an environment with parcel. Make sure that endpoints that can connect to those and see what this is. So we have something over school running from three, we have something on theta. So that's there. Um, we then do a bunch of importing. This is using parcel 072 alpha one. We're at 08 alpha now. Probably 08 should be out in a week, hopefully. Uh, we have a config object then that actually is set up. Uh, because these systems use two factor authentication, we have to type in some stuff. Um, so the config thing then is, is, is important. So there's a data piece, and when you actually execute this, then you get prompt to put in your passwords, which we're doing. Uh, theta password, then uh, order password. Tough to do your inventory. So. See some typing at the end of that. Right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so that happens. And now we're going to we're just going to say, right, here's a bunch of things that happen, the host name, the channel, the queuing information, the working directory, specify, which is part of the ugliness of all this. Uh, same thing for query. And so we actually then load this configuration, which happens here. It can take a few minutes because that actually has to get to the nodes at this point. Um, and we can actually see, sorry, this is, I've seen this a few times. Part of the typing is that, that I see the typo happening, but I can't so I can watch the typo. Is it done SQS? No. It was just user was spelled wrong, actually. Okay. The next dress. Um, don't do that. Yeah, sorry. So, uh, and we do the same thing. So we're basically right, we're watching the queues on or on yeah. Maybe these aren't the best way to do this. Sorry. But. I think it's every two seconds. Yeah, that's too long. <laughs> <laughs> Stop. <laughs> yeah. All right. Anyhow, so we're doing that. Uh, so this finished. We have a configuration set. And 
then we actually can start running things. And so in this case, uh, we have applications defined on things for 10 seconds, and they basically return the so this is pretty straightforward. I'm actually going to uh, see if I can jump ahead a little bit. Okay. So we're actually running these things, um, and they're not done yet. So they were the futures were trained, which is one of the exciting things in futures. Here we're actually blocking through results, and so checking to see what's going on. And something's going on. Uh, sorry, this is, I think there was a little bit of a delay here in actually getting stuff to run. So I'm just going to keep jumping ahead a little bit until <laughs> I see something happening. Okay, and eventually these things do run and they return. Uh, this is to actually move some data around. So you create two apps, one that writes a uh, message on theta. This file the same file on hold and append to that file. <clears throat> and so uh, yeah. when you're running things remotely, yeah. you have to have Set up in the it looked like you had a client okay. environment. It's already kind of proud. Yes. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yep. So that's right. Yeah. Wait, so that's, that's two different questions. Okay. Still have to call the imports. I'm assuming you do, but. Yeah. Oh, I search your data. Yeah. yeah. In his, uh, in the definition of the function, that's all those imports. Right, so within the function you're doing, is there a you know, caching and some of that stuff? So if you're, if you're importing, so it's a, it does, the, the, does the worker keep state from one request to the next? Or, and the reason I bring that up is we've had right. some, there's some performance in the plan. Right. Um, I think that the answer is that we don't do that caching right now. Um, this is all like relatively new and this is all still very much in progress. So the, I, th I think that could be done. Um, I, I don't know. There, we've had a lot of discussion about caching and, and also about um, being clever in where we run jobs, where the work already is, and then knowing that it's already there and not doing it. So, so there's a bunch of stuff here that's kind of in progress, and I, but I don't, I don't believe that that happens right now. Okay, I'm curious if we have a lot of We're evaluating sort of a set of different tools for the client. Right. 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 Yeah, so I, I would be very happy to talk about that. Sorry, the reason I went back to this was to look at the Yado piece there. So, um, so we definitely would want to have Yado in this conversation. So, okay. Anyhow, so I'm going to stop with this demo, which you actually could see. Uh, sorry, and just jump back for a second. Um, Sorry, uh, just as a, as a stopping point, you can just see that this file uh, actually did have these two things. So it did, right, it did get created on Theta, it got appended on Cori, it came back, and we can then cat it within the notebook. So, um, okay. So then back to this. Okay, so the other thing that's interesting, or, or one of the other things that we're doing, is we recognize that there's a bunch of different kinds of parallel applications that people are running, including things that are high throughput, um, like the CERN work or like protein docking, where we've got uh, something like thousands of tasks and hundreds of nodes. Um, and we're really concerned about reliability and usability and elasticity on clouds and monitoring and things like that. We have extreme scale workloads where we're really running like on a, and on a single HPC system and we want to run on hundreds of thousands of cores or maybe millions of cores. Um, and we're really more worried about capacity. And then we have interactive and real-time workloads where 
we're really more interested in, in rapid response. And so we have applications of all these types, and we realized that we couldn't really build an execution environment, a single execution environment that supported all of them as well as we could. And so rather than doing that, we have three different execution environments right now, and you choose the one that matches the, the workload that you have. So one of them is the high throughput executor that's designed for ease of use and supporting clusters and clouds and fault tolerance. Um, less than 2,000 nodes, something like 60,000 workers, maybe a million tasks, uh, task duration on the order of, uh, of a hundredth of a second uh, kind of works okay. Below that doesn't work very well. Uh, above that is fine, obviously. Um, uh, extreme scale executor, which uh, has distributed MPI working on it, um, uh, and having a manager rank that's communicating the workload to other workers. And so that goes above a thousand nodes, uh, maybe a million tasks, 30,000 workers. Uh, tasks there have to be larger than a minute uh, in order for this to work efficiently. And I'll provide some more results on another slide. And then the low latency executor, which um, basically doesn't do any fault tolerance and doesn't do a lot of other stuff, but, uh, but works really quickly. Um, that uh, is probably good for something that's a small number of nodes and a relatively small, like less than a million tasks. I'm sorry, I don't know if that's small or not. But us in some sense it can be small. Um, so just to show some scaling results then, uh, these are weak scaling results. To compare um, our executors, the high throughput and the uh, extreme scale with IGP and with NASC and with fireworks, just a few other things to show. Uh, we know that uh, like fireworks as an example is not designed to do things for fast tasks, so this isn't exactly a fair comparison in some sense, but it's it's a comparison. Um, DASC also Works relatively well for time, but it stops scaling. Get some smaller number of nodes that we want to use, and that's part of the reason that we wanted to build something ourselves. Um, and right, and, uh, and I guess then in terms of strong scaling results, uh, this is right a fixed workload that we're just increasing the number of workers. Uh, again, uh, fire which is fine, that makes sense. Um, IPP is also fairly bad. Um, DASC is pretty good up to some point and then it starts getting to be a little bit bad and, and we're continuing to be good a little bit further out. Again, this is a little bit unfair because it, it's certainly possible that somebody that's a DASC expert or a DASC developer could make this work better, um, but, but this is just kind of what we did out of the box. Uh, and so, Different frameworks we could use, uh, IPP, the high throughput extreme scale executor, fireworks, SAS. Um, we can say that as far as we can tell, we can get up to larger numbers of workers, we can get up to larger number of nodes, and we can mostly get more throughput, although DAS in some cases actually has pretty good throughput as well. So, in most, uh, what is HT versus extreme high throughput? Yeah, it's high throughput and extreme scale. So, it's basically it's these two things. It's the this extreme scale is the one that's built on top of MPI, and high throughput is basically pilot jobs not built on MPI. Why is the performance for the HT better than the EXDX? Um, I don't have a good answer for that. It's not, I mean, it's not significantly different, but I don't know, I don't know exactly why. <laughs> I would, what, I mean, what I would, limit, What limits the maximum number of workers, which is size of machine? Um, size of machine and in some of our testing, actually just the size of the allocation we could get and use in a, with a reasonable allocation that we had from the, from the providers. So some of this, um, some of this was on Blue Waters and we were using an allocation that was a materials science researchers allocation and he said, you can use this much to do this test. So it's, I, I don't know, some of these things are limits of scale and some are limits that we just haven't tried bigger. Yeah. I, think, I think I kind of want to ask this, but yeah. do you guys have metrics or plans to have metrics for the communication before and after? Yeah, so there's... Um, so basically the gatherer. Well, yes and no. Um, so there's, sorry, let me, uh, let me come back to that. Can ask that again at the end. I can, I can show you something that kind of answers what you want, but it's not exactly what you want, I think. So 
Let me, let me go on though for the minute. So the other things that Parcel then is doing is, or many of the things Parcel is doing, so it does resource abstraction, which I kind of talked about a little bit. Uh, it does fault tolerance and supports retries, which I haven't talked about at all, but we do checkpointing and memoization. Um, so we basically do a hash of the function and a hash of the inputs. And if you have this turned on and you call the same function with the same inputs, we just return the answer rather than actually running the job again. Uh, checkpointing basically does the same thing. It checks to see if the job is already run. And if some of it's already run, then we can just use the result rather than rerunning that thing if, if something died. That's right. That's implemented, yeah. It's not on by default, um, and it probably needs more testing, but it is implemented. So if you go on and hit wall time, you just resubmit it and it'll pick up from where it was? Everything that's finished should not rerun, yeah. Things that were in progress, yeah. That's what it should do, yes. That's the way it has to Is it checkpointing? It's not checkpointing the apps themselves. Right, it's, check, it's just checkpointing the apps. Right, so it's the outputs of the tasks are being stored, not the state of the tasks. It's the state of the job based on the state of the tasks. Where does that state get stored? Um, yeah, so it's either in files, if it is files, or it's in... Um, I'm trying to think if it's not in files. <laughs> It's in the notebook, and I don't actually know how that's getting stored, so I'm not sure. That's a good question. Um, elasticity, we're not really talking about clouds, but we do have elasticity working, so you can right, call, you can right, increase and decrease the amount of cloud resources you have as you need them. Uh, I didn't talk about monitoring at all. We have some relatively primitive monitoring, so you can see what's going on. We're, we're, one of the groups we're working with is the desk collaboration. That's one of the LSST groups. Um, and they were very insistent on monitoring, and we've done some things for them. Um, in particular, they were one of the groups that were using um, Beta and Cori, and so there's, we have some monitoring that is okay, and it gives you some limited information, and it was enough for them to be satisfied with, but it certainly could be improved, and that's one of the areas we're, we're trying to improve with some student projects currently. What is the level of the monitoring, like jobs? It's, it's basically, it's tasks and their utilization, like memory and disk and other things. Um, uh, Globus I mentioned, data management I mentioned, containers I didn't really mention, Jupyter integration is kind of obvious and reproducibility and provenance is something we don't do very well at, but we do have some logging and some provenance and this is another area that we could certainly improve a lot more than we've done at this point. Um, right, so we're doing this in a bunch of different applications and I don't really want to go into these in great detail because of time, but um, but it's, again, it's kind of a mix of kind of machine learning, big simulation, interactive jobs, the things we were talking about before. Uh, one thing I do want to mention is that in the configuration part, um, the, the, the pictures are all from the read the docs, do those snapshots I took this morning. Uh, so we do environment configuration, execution environment and configuration through config options, and we have examples of how to do that, and that's based on where the tasks execute, which executor you're using, where the main parcel program executes, which provider you're using, and which launcher. And so this is really complicated for most users, and it's just a pain. Uh, and I don't really know of a better way to do this. Um, so we have examples for systems where we just have configs set up that, that mostly work, except then we also have to say that the users have to actually customize those. They can't just use even that. Um, so this is kind of a painful thing. So. Uh, so just to mention a couple of things that if we get into this uh, this workflow um, discussion this afternoon, which maybe we'll get to this afternoon, uh, I'm kind of interested in, in thinking about if we can describe HPC and other remote systems in some way that's actually common for a bunch of us, for Jupyter Lab instances, for parcel yeah. instances, for other things. Right. So right now everybody does this and every user has to understand all their systems separately and then it would be nice if we could move to something like Globus endpoints that are maintained by Ideally, by the site people, just register those, and people that want to use those could just pull those out and then maybe customize them a little bit. Uh, I was trying to figure out when I was writing this yesterday if Batch Spawner and React Spawner are helpful. I'm not completely sure. I don't quite think they do. I think they're doing something a little different, but maybe could use this if we had this. But I, again, I'm not 100% sure it was. Uh, and then the other thing is describing the applications themselves. So the things that we're calling tasks basically are, again, are wrapped functions or wrapped applications. Um, we do this for Parcel. Um, people for CWL do this with a different interface around them. People for Pegasus do this with a different interface around them. 
it would be nice if we had some common method for this so we could say, all right, we want to run this app and, and here are the people that develop this app tell us what its inputs are and what its outputs are. And we can just, in a machine readable way, bring this in rather than having to tell the user that's we're using Parcel that they have to, to figure this out for themselves. So that's another thing that I would be interested in talking about if anybody else is. Um, so overall, uh, Parcel is providing what we think is simple, safe, scalable, flexible parallelism in Python. Uh, minimal new concepts, works in Jupyter. Um, flexible, it's uh, again open source on GitHub. I was actually, I was kind of happy yesterday. I found we have 142 stars. Um, so we're moving up quite quickly. We were like really excited when we got to 100. That was a, a tweet. That was fun. Uh, and so we're moving towards version one. I don't know when we're going to get to version one. It might be six months. It might be a year. But we're we're on the way there. So um, right. And oh, sorry. The other thing is, if anybody's going to HPDC in a couple of weeks, we have a paper that's there, and there's a preprint available. Um, and it's one of four best paper candidates. So hopefully it'll. Winning, you know, so if anybody's voting, um, <laughs> vote for it. All right. Uh, yeah. So that's it. So let me um, let me come back to your question then again for a second. Let's see if I can do this. Uh, no, I can't do this. Um, it's going to work. Yes. Okay. So this is um, this is just latency for different executors, which isn't exactly what you were asking, but it certainly is part of it. Um, and so. Full executor is milliseconds. Um, the low latency executor is roughly three milliseconds. The high throughput executor is like four to five. The chain scale one that's kind of six to seven, but also it could be a lot longer. So there's something that's going on there that I don't completely understand. Um, IPP is kind of out here at 12. Dask is out here at 16, and then there's a few more bits of the extreme scale one. So. So the extreme scale one is doing something that's a little bit strange at this point, but that's a little bit of what I can tell you about, about this piece of things. So, and this is, right, yeah. What is the high throughput? There's not a single answer to that. Um, I, and I don't remember what it is in this case. I think this is an SSH channel. So it's using this setup. Well, so in terms of like the experiment and the timing, it's setting something up and not timing it and then using running it a bunch of times over that channel once it's set up. So this is not the setup time. This is the. I, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Treat MPI the same way, right? Yeah, yeah. Any other questions or comments or? Anything else? Okay, thank you.